Thank you for your presence with us this morning. Thank you for everyone who's contributed, those verbally, but those also here as part of the body, as a joint, as a ligament, as a, a, a vital element of this fellowship. We're here encouraging one another in our walk with you, in our relationship with you. We're here in challenging each other also, Lord, in terms of how we live, how we evidence the work that you've already done in us by your spirit through good works. Help us, Lord, to be more like Jesus who went about preaching salvation, doing good works, healing the sick. Help us to be more like him and open our ears and eyes. Continue to speak to us, we pray, through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, so this is statement of faith number nine. There are 12 fundamentals that the Assemblies of God believe in. Um, and this is number nine. And it goes like this. We believe in the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of Christ in the church today. This AOG statement of faith divides easily into two parts, so we'll deal with each part. I might only get through the first one. Uh, we believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the church operating today. March the, 6th, March the 17th, 2024. We believe. We believe. We not only believe, we experience as you open up to the Holy Spirit, as you say, yes, Lord Jesus, fill me afresh with your Holy Spirit. Guide me, use me. You will experience that. You experience, it's wonderful. Let me put this into scripture. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 11. If you'd like to follow me, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but the same God works all of them in all people. Oh, sorry, I'm, you know what I'm like, don't you? I'm going to pause here. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. If you've ever met somebody who is into mediums, clairvoyance, and certainly Christian, what do they call themselves? Christian, Christian scientists. No, no, no. no. Yeah, Christian scientists. Yes. I'm thinking of something else, but maybe similar. And they call on demons to, yeah, they call on spirits. Christian spiritualists, that's what I'm trying to say, them, right? So people who call themselves Christian spirits, spiritualists, will use scripture or abuse scripture, but they will say that they are empowered to do X, Y, and Z by a different spirit. So a different spirit will come along and enable them to do certain things supernaturally. And they'll need different spirits, stroke demons, to do these things. 1 Corinthians 12 says, there are different gifts, but one spirit. Not many spirits, one spirit. Let me continue. Now, to each of the one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. I'll pause there again. The common good. Um, Serge shared earlier on about the inverted pyramid. It always has been. Leadership. Servant leadership has always been leading through serving. Unless man gets involved, and sadly it's generally men who get involved and twist it and warp it and make it something that it shouldn't, shouldn't be. But any gift that you and I have, whether natural or supernatural, whether obvious or not, should be for the benefit of others. It's not for me bigging myself up. I'm still quite good at basketball. I'm amazed that I'm still quite good at People who watch me, I'm quite amazed I'm still good at basketball. I was on the court a few weeks ago just shooting some hoops. You know, free. Don't look at me like that, John. So, you know, two, you know, three throws, step back. You know the three point line? Swish. In it went. Oh, it was amazing. I was so pleased with myself. Um, and I had, my, I had my earphones on. And this chap was doing something very near me. What I don't understand when you're in a, in a court, there's a big court, people always want to muck about underneath the basketball net. Why? Go over there. Not right into it. Anyway, I was shooting some hoops. This guy came up to me and he said, do you mind if we do whatever here? I said, no problems. I took my earphones off. And then he did a double take. He said, oh, it's you, Padre. I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, didn't know you shot hoops. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Looks good, didn't it? <laughs> Michael Jordan, you know. <laughs> anyway, what's the point? The point is, that's a natural gift that I've got. 
okay? I've played basketball for most of my life. Even at 62, I can still shoot some hoops. I can't quite dunk it, but hey, natural gift. So whatever your gifts are, whether they're natural, supernatural, internal, external, they're not there to big you up. They're there to serve the body. We're here to serve others, both within these four walls and outside these four walls. Amen? So use your gifts. Somebody once said, use it or lose it. And if you can't use the gift that you used to have, ask God for another. He's got plenty of gifts still to give you. Okay. Um, so the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given the Spirit, the message of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings, plural, by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits. I've already touched on that. Just because something's supernatural doesn't mean it's of God. Always check the source. If it doesn't align with the word of God and what the Holy Spirit is doing, then it's demonic. Don't believe all the spirits, the word says, but test them. So the gift of discerning of spirits, we need that in the church ever more today because there's so much deception. To another, uh, speaking in different kinds of languages, and I put, I'm going to try and say that, different languages. The term tongues is still very um, difficult. People don't like it. I know it's scriptural, but the original word is languages. <laughs> and still to another, the interpretation of languages. All of these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. So, as Beatrice said, salvation is not something we can earn. It's a gift that we need to receive as a gift. The gifts of the Spirit, guess what? Are gifts of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit distributes them across the body as he wills. And we're all different. And we've all got something to bring. So this passage forms the basis of what we believe about spiritual gifts. And of course, this follows on nicely from the subject that I looked at last time or two times ago, which was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so when I started this series about three or four months ago, I did say for, for the most part, what we believe is historical, traditional, biblical, Protestant Christianity. We, we're in line with our brothers and sisters across the denominations. But there are one or two things that are distinctive to us as the Assemblies of God of Great Britain as a Pentecostal denomination. The last one, two times ago, was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this one is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's distinct to us as a Pentecostal denomination. Firstly, we believe in what we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's the reception of the Holy Spirit specifically for the purpose of empowerment for mission. So those first disciples on the day of Pentecost were told to wait until they're endued with power from on high. They were told to wait. They're already born again. They're already Christians. They'd already had received the Holy Spirit. But God, God, through Jesus, said, wait. But that wasn't a one-off. The day of Pentecost was a one-off. But the filling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism, we believe, still continues today. And if you've not been baptized in the Holy Spirit and you'd like to be, come and see me, please. I'll explain it to you. So this baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, is distinct, but it's not necessarily separate from the reception of the Holy Spirit for the purpose of salvation. And we saw this a few times ago when I preached, when we we're looking at Peter and the Roman centurion. H him and his household were saved and also baptized in the Holy Spirit at the same time. But there are two distinct things going on, overlapping at the same time. For most of us, if we're honest, they're distinct. They happen chrono chronologically in different times. So I was saved, and event uh, after a few months, I was baptized in the Spirit. And I imagine for most of us, that's a similar situation. It may have taken longer. And it may be that there was a time gap between you being receiving the Spirit in terms of salvation and receiving the Spirit in terms of endowment of power, because you hadn't been taught. That's what there was. You hadn't been taught. That's what scripture teaches. You may have been taught. That's not for today. I'll come on to that in a bit. Secondly, we believe that once someone has been baptized in the spirit, they can be and are empowered to use spiritual gifts. 
And by spiritual gifts, I refer to the list of the nine gifts that I just mentioned from 1 Corinthians. Those gifts, all yours. God wants to give you those gifts. And you may say, well, I don't have any of them. If you've been baptized in the spirit, you do. You've just not functioned in using them. Or you may be a little bit cautious. Let me encourage you. This is a safe space. I want this church to be a place where many of us use the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We hear from God and we speak out. Or we lay hands on people and they're healed. And it's not just for a Sunday morning. Um, very often, well, sometimes, not very often, when I'm in my, when I'm, um, I have people with me and I'm, they're sharing with me, etc. And I, I, I ask them if they'd like prayer. And more often than not, people will say yes. If the Lord, give, if the Lord gives me a word of knowledge or wisdom, or I, I have the faith to lay hands for healing, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And it's up to God if anything happens. But I'm not going to raise a flag and say, oh, by the way, here's a word of knowledge. I'm just going to give them to you. Just make it natural. Supernaturally natural when you're dealing with people. Certainly outside these four walls. Don't be shy. Don't be afraid. If you've got drops something in your heart, run with it. You never know what he's going to do. You never know what life he's going to change. So these nine gifts that I've just mentioned. And as an aside, charismatic Christians also believe we can use spiritual gifts today. Uh, when I was first saved, I was a charismatic Christian. Because I never went to a Pentecostal church. I went to a charismatic church. And then when I started at, at, um, attending an AOG church, I didn't know the difference. Because actually there's not much difference. The fundamental thing with charismatic Christians is that they don't necessarily believe in a separate endowment of power. So they believe that using the gifts of the Spirit as a natural, supernatural overflow of being in Christ. And okay, I'm not going to argue with them. If they're baptized in the Spirit, that's good enough for me. If they're using the gifts, that's absolutely fine. If they're honoring the name of Jesus, it's not up to me to argue with them. So as, charis as with charismatics, we are not cessationists. We're not cessationists, which is to say some church groups, especially within the Reformed tradition, so in the UK, these include Presbyterian Church, Church of Scotland, and congregational churches, amongst others, these denominations believe that certain miraculous and supernatural things, yes, happened in the New Testament, but that, that was never intended that these things should continue through the church age. Rather, those things, especially the things of a more supernatural nature, would cease, hence the term cessationists. We would call ourselves continuists. Uh, and that's true. Uh, down, down, if you go down through church history, the gifts have always been there. But often, those groups were considered heretics by the then prevailing overarching dogma of Roman Catholicism. We said, well, if you don't come under our umbrella, you're heretics. But they weren't. They've been led by the Spirit. So the gifts have always been there. There's a wonderful book called The Unending Stream, or Unfailing Stream, by... I shouldn't do this, should I? I was going to say David Petz, but certainly not David Petz. It's David Allen. Dave Allen, if you can find it on, online, uh, The Unending Stream. He, look, he profiles the gifts of the Spirit in the church from the first century all the way to now. Never stopped. Always been there. Hallelujah. So cessationists say that was for New Testament times only. And they use 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 10 to support this view. And, and if you know your Bible, right at the end of Paul's wonderful discourse on love, he talks about when the perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. That little bit, cessation to say, ah, we got you, you penties, you charismatics, we got you now. Because the perfection for them is considered to refer to com the complete canon of Scripture. So they say we now have the whole of the Bible, therefore we don't need the supernatural. We don't need spiritual gifts. And the full canon of Scripture was recognized at the Council of Rome in 382. Did you know that? Some of you knew it. 382. 
So all spiritual gifts have ceased, according to cessationists. And John Calvin is often credited with first proposing this view. Now, I'm not going to ask you who's a Calvinist here, and I'm not going to ask who's an Arminianist here, because you'll look at me and go, what are you on about, John? But parts of the church will split themselves into these two camps. And I never knew about that when I was saved. I just knew Jesus. Hallelujah. Didn't make any difference to me. And the more I've looked at both these views, the more I think they're both two ends of the extreme, that somewhere in the middle we find the truth. So you don't have to be one or the other. There are doctrines of truth in both, but there's uh, error in both as well. So John Calvin, Calvinists follow a lot of his teachings. We in the Assemblies of God, along with other Trinitarian Pentecostal denominations and charismatic Christians within mainstream denominations, do not hold a cessationist view. We believe that even with the Bible here, perfection has not yet come. <laughs> Who looked in the mirror this morning? <laughs> How perfect did you feel? How perfect do you feel day by day? Born again, spirit filled, washed in the blood of the Lamb, knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior, joyful in your redemption and salvation, changing day by day. Any of you ever felt perfect? Me neither. The holiness movement of the 19th century put a huge burden on an awful lot of people. Because basically, the basic premise of the holiness movement was once you're saved, once you're born again, once you're sanctified, once you're baptized in the spirit, you will never sin. Wow. That would have lasted about an hour, I reckon. But, it, it, you know, but it didn't, sadly. And people were put under tremendous burdens because we know how easy it is to sin. We know our struggles. We know perfection has not yet come. We know that the Lord, through his Holy Spirit, is perfecting you and I. Amen, Rona? We're getting there. He's perfecting us. But it takes a lifetime for each and every one of us. And even then some. Actually, it takes eternity. So there's no such thing as total perfection. When the perfect comes, we don't need the gifts of the Spirit. We don't need supernatural signs and wonders because we've got, we've got this. Hallelujah, we've got the written word, both Old and New Testament. That is more than enough for you and I with the Holy Spirit guiding and directing us. So we're not cessationists. We are still in the context whereby we know only in part. Any of you know, you know everything? <laughs> Stephen Hawking, did he know everything? you think he did, the way people worshipped him. He knew a tiny smidgen, a little bit, and yet one of the brainiest people on the planet. Um, there are some people who you talk to them, and they think that they know everything. They don't. We know a tiny speck of all that there is to know, even with the revelation of the Holy Spirit guiding us. We only know in part. And we peer through a glass darkly. You know that glass? You know, rub it, have a little look in. Yes, about what can you see? Not a lot. Even with the new glasses. We, we can see something. And the little that we see is incredible. It's amazing. And we kind of go, wow, thank you, Lord. But we see so little. We're not perfect by any means. Therefore, spiritual gifts, as far as the assemblies of God is concerned, have not ceased. We desperately need the gifts manifest in the church. And ultimately, that's why we also believe in the baptism in water. John the Dipper, John the Baptist. Excellent. That's what they did in the New Testament. They baptized people in water. So we baptize people in water. Because that's what they did in the New Testament. We appreciate that the New Testament churches, however, were part, far from perfect, which Paul's first letter to the Corinthian church shows all too well and all too clear. He admonishes and corrects some very unchristian behavior going on in that church. 
Not perfect. Even the New Testament church that people would like to go back to. Far from perfect. We are far from perfect. But we're in the process of being changed. We're in the process of being remodeled. We're in the process of being put back together. We're in the process of being healed from our brokenness. As we yield to Jesus. As we honor God. As we allow the Holy Spirit to do in us only what he can do. So in terms of faith and practice, we consider the New Testament texts to be the paradigm for in the first century, in the 21st century, and for all future generations of Christians until Christ returns. The New Testament, the scripture, that's what we look at. If it's good enough for the New Testament, in terms of practice, guess what? It's good enough for us. It's good enough for us. We don't chop things off and say, oh, no, no, no. And a lot of this happened. And maybe I'm just jumping ahead. A lot of this happened after Constantine made Christianity a um, legal religion. I'll, I'll mention that in a bit. So firstly, if we do not follow New Testament faith and practice, what faith and practice do we follow? If it's not from the New Testament, if it's not scriptural, where are we getting our faith? Where are we getting our teachings? Where are we getting our practice from? Hmm. I strongly believe that much of what the church has got wrong over the last 2,000 years is when it's made it up itself, which involved men, generally, trying to puff themselves up and seek power and control others at Pyramid. And we still have it today, do we not? Across certain denominations where we have a pyramid, bloke at the top, normally a bloke. Any ladies know of a lady at the top of a pyramid in the church? No? Any? Can't think of any, really. Not in terms of denominations. Normally men who want to control and, manipulation, and manipulate and abuse <coughs> and coerce people to do what they want to do rather than what the Spirit of God is telling us to do. And sadly, abuse of power, coercion and manipulation have been the hallmarks of corrupt doctrine and practice since Constantine made Christianity the religion of Rome. Anybody know when? Apart from you, Peter. <laughs> the Edict of Milan, 1313. All councils and creeds and controversies in the first few hundred years of the church. Thrashing things out. What do we believe? What don't we believe? What do we include in canon? What don't? What's scriptural? What's canonical? What's heretical? Praise God, guided by the Holy Spirit. But at that point, when religion, uh, Christianity became a legal religion, the church changed its mode of operating. The church changed from being led by the Spirit to being led by men. And all sorts of things came in that were not biblical in any way, shape or form. Now, I know we must engage with contemporary culture. Of course we must. Otherwise, we become irrelevant. But to be led by any man-made culture is extremely dangerous. So, yes, we must engage with where we are at the moment. We must engage with the people amongst whom we're living. We must try and share the good news of Jesus. And as we heard earlier on, start thanking the Lord for your loved ones who will be in this church at some point in the future. And some of you will be sitting there going, not a chance this side of heaven. Uh, that could have been you 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Not a chance. Certainly was me. So start praying for them and thanking God for their salvation. Whether they come here or not is absolutely irrelevant. We want them in the kingdom. We want them in the kingdom worshiping Jesus. So we mustn't allow contemporary culture. And Peter shared earlier on about how we are laying down our lives, how we are not to be conformed by what's going on around. Because what's going on around now will change in five years, and it will change again in another 10, and then there's something else in another 15. The cycle continues. And if the church is blown here and there by deceit and doctrine of men, rather than the unending doctrine of the Holy Spirit and Scripture, we're going to go all over the place. And sadly, there are groups of people meeting up and down this nation and across the world 
who have been blown here, there and everywhere because they're rejecting what the scripture tells us about truth and doctrine. We must engage with contemporary culture, but to be led by it is really, really dangerous. Secondly, I would suggest that any and every revival, every move of God's spirit down through the centuries has been hallmarked by the desire to return to the New Testament. Whether it's Reformation, salvation by faith, whether it's Methodist holiness of life, whether it's Baptist baptism in water, whether it's Pentecostal being filled with the Spirit, or new church restoration of Ephesians 4.11 ministry gifts, whether it's all of that, we're always pointing back to the New Testament. We're always looking back at that early church and going, what did they do then? Where are we different now? And the question is, what new move will God do in his church in our day and age? Are you looking for that? And it has to be scriptural, but it may be something new from the Lord. What's he going to do amongst you and I? So we believe that spiritual gifts should be used in the church today. We need to speak into people's lives. And they don't want JB's thoughts. They need a word from the Holy Spirit. They need a touch from the Holy Spirit. Whatever that looks like, it will be a gift that you are using through you to them. Don't be shy. Don't be coy. Don't be fearful about allowing the Holy Spirit to work through you for the benefit of others. There can be a tendency in, con uh, in the con contemporary context to remove spiritual gifts from the large congregation, the sort of attractional setting, even with 50 or so of us here. That may be too, too big for people to use their gifts. And they remove it to smaller, more intimate settings. But if we don't use the gifts here, who's, who, who are they benefiting? It has to be for people who are not yet saved, generally. Uh, yes, we hear prophecy and words of wisdom and knowledge. That's great. That's encouraging us as believers, God speaking to us. But we want to use them for the benefit of those not yet in the kingdom. So let's not be shy, even in this context, to use whatever gift you may have. We have to model the gifts so that people expect to use them. If you've come from a, a background or denomination that says they're not for today, guess what? You won't choose to use them. You won't know they're for today, therefore you won't uh, use them. And if they don't see them being used, you, they won't be modeled and you think, well, I can't do it. Or, or only, only that person says X or that person says Y. I can't. Yes, you can. If you've been baptized in the spirit, ask the Lord, what is my gift, Lord? What gift am I not using? Or what did I used to use and I'm no longer using? Safe, leaderless places, where, uh, leader, leader, leader led places where we can use the gifts. In this group, in smaller groups, let's not be shy. Let's be people who are full of the Spirit. Um, are you okay for me to keep going a little bit more? Is that okay? I know it's very warm in here. I know some folk are struggling a bit. Uh, when we do use the gifts, we need order. So Paul's admonishment to the church in Corinthians, he says, what's happening? When you all come together, brothers and sisters, every one of you has a hymn, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. In other words, he's saying, why? It's too much. You can't take it all in. So even this morning, we've had... Six or seven people share? How much of what they've shared will we remember when we leave? And that's just six or seven people. Can you imagine a church where everybody's standing up? Everybody's having a go. It's mayhem. So Paul says, be in order. So if we're going to use the gifts, let's be people who do it in order. God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, he says, as in all the churches of the Lord's people. Even a river needs river banks. We've seen around and about here with the rain that we've had. It's disaster when the banks burst, is it not? Let's keep the gifts within the tram lines of the word of God. Then it's a safe space for people to share, for people to hear, for people to be challenged. 
Uh, another few minutes and then I'll finish. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 6. Let me just read this for you. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. And if you look at this very, very quickly, this scripture, you can see a Trinitarian doctrine here. There are different gifts, I said this earlier on, but the same spirit, verse 4, Holy Spirit. There are different ministries, verse 5, but the same Lord, the Lord Jesus, Spirit, Lord Jesus. And there are different energies, one translation puts it, but the same God, the Father. So Paul is referring here to spiritual gifts given by the descended spirit to individual be believers. And that's what Paul primarily deals with in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. Spiritual gifts given to you as individuals. What is your spiritual gift? How many do you have? Uh, one of my former pastors put it something along the lines of a bow and arrow and quiver full of arrows. And he said that we have all the gifts. If you've been baptized in the spirit, you have every single gift, all nine of them in your quiver. Just need to take out the right one at the right time and use it. And you may say, but I've never used that before. I've never laid hands on anyone for healing. There may be a time where God wants you to lay hands on someone and ask for healing and pray for healing. Oh, I've never spoken in tongues. You should. We've covered this already. If you've been baptized in the spirit, you should speak in tongues. You should speak in unknown languages. You may not interpret, that's for congregational context, but your own spiritual language should be there for your self-edification when you're praying on your own. In the context of the congregation, that's a different thing altogether. Spiritual gifts given by the descended spirit, the one whom came on the day of Pentecost, and the world's never been the same. And then we have ministry gifts. We mentioned that already today. Individuals given by the ascended Christ to the church as a whole. So spiritual gifts given to you and I individually, ministry gifts, individuals given by the ascended Christ to the church as a whole. So apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors. Fivefold ministry gifts we find in Ephesians 4.11. Funny that. We've spoken about that already today. And then thirdly, natural gifts or energies given by the Father to the whole of humanity. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly light. So God gives you natural gifts. And sometimes they can be elevated by the Spirit. Some people think that the baptism, the gifts of the Spirit are just elevated natural gifts. They're not. They're different. They're supernatural. They're spiritual. But you have natural gifts. I bet I could beat any of you at basketball today. <laughs> take me on. You take me on. Natural gift. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from you, Peter. I'm scared now. You know, your natural gifts. That's wonderful. God's giving those to you. What are they? Are you using your natural gifts for the benefit of the church, for the benefit of your loved ones? For the benefit of your neighborhood and your neighbors are you using this spiritual gifts likewise not for your own self-gratification but for other people and are you a gift to the church you definitely are each and every one of you i'm going to call you ligaments from now on are you a ligament or are you a tendon what's the difference between a ligament and a tendon peter i just want to know a good exercise as I close for each and every one of us here this morning is to ask the Holy Spirit to help us to identify our giftings in these three areas. What natural gifts have you got that you're no longer using? Because you're too dot, 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 dot. You can fill in the blank. What natural gift are you not? What spiritual gift are you not using? Have you not yet used? Or did you use once and have not used it ever since? 
And what gift are you today to the body of Christ? Now, you may not be apostle, an apostle. I'm not. But do you prophesy? Are you a prophet? Have you got the gift of evangelism? Can you teach? Can you shepherd the flock pastorally? What's, what's that sort of gifting to you uh, from God? A mixture of these gifts is referred at the end of uh, 1 Corinthians 12. I'm not going to read it now, but we are the body of Christ. We need all these gifts and no one person has each and every one of them. None of us has all of them. That's why we need each other. We need each other. We need each other in the gathered context, as we heard already, and that's what we call church. We gather together.